By multilingual, I mean living with more than one language and regularly using them in daily life, fluently. And by fluent, I mean it in the original sense. In Latin, fluentum means flowing. So to be fluent means to speak or sign in a flowing manner. And this counts even if a multilingual has a non-native accent or produces some grammatical errors. It's simply a myth that unless someone speaks language flawlessly, that person is not fluent. By that measure, think of how many monolinguals would miss the cut. Lastly, I need to define monolingual. By this, I mean being fluent in only one language. So even though I can get by in France and Japan with my spotty French and Japanese, I am most certainly a monolingual English speaker. Traditional approaches to understanding language have focused primarily on people like me as the model language user. In fact, even to this day, many scientific studies on language, including from my own lab at Colgate, explicitly exclude multilinguals. The idea is that they introduce too much unwanted variability to the data, and this makes it harder to answer basic research questions about language more generally. Fair enough, but if you consider the actual number of multilinguals on the planet, you might ask why we would run away from this variability rather than embrace it. After all, the linguist Francois Grosjean estimates that over half of the world's population regularly uses more than one language. And even in countries with many monolinguals, like the US, multilingualism is not some fringe phenomenon. In fact, recent estimates suggest that about 50 million bilinguals live in the United States today. So there goes another myth. Around the world, multilingualism is not the exception. It's actually the rule. Given its prevalence, it's surprising that systematic research on multilingualism is so young. Linguists have long made comparisons across languages, but not until the 1950s were there large-scale theoretical attempts to systematically investigate how people learn multiple languages. Looking back, most scholars now point to a classic book published in 1957 by the American linguist Robert Ladeau as the start of multilingualism as a field of study. The book, Linguistics Across Cultures, presented a theoretical framework to explain how one's native language can make it easier or harder to learn various second languages. For example, Ladeau's theory predicted that it should be easier to learn Spanish if you already know Italian because the two share so many linguistic features. But learning Italian should be much harder if your native language is Cantonese because it's so radically different in almost every way. Now, this theory has since been challenged by some more recent empirical studies. In fact, there's evidence that in some cases, it's actually easier to learn certain aspects of a language that are very different from your native language. Still, Ladeau's le legacy lives on. His work has been extremely influential because it officially put multilingualism on the map for empirical study. Another myth, or at least a mi misconception, is that multilingualism is a single categorical thing. To appreciate what I mean, consider monolingualism as a category. I don't mean this in a bad way, but being monolingual is pretty homogenous. Barring genetic disorders, physical constraints, or extreme neglect, all monolinguals become fluent in pretty much the same way. In contrast, multilingualism is much less uniform, and this is due to the myriad of idiosyncratic contexts of learning more than one language. Think about it. Monolinguals share remarkably similar learning contexts. For spoken language, almost everyone is the same age when they're exposed to speech, and their spoken exposure comes from every possible angle, from the home, classroom, broader society, you name it. Not only that, but monolingual speakers almost always learn language from other monolinguals. Things are different for multilinguals in every way. For starters, the age range of when they learn a second language is extremely wide. It could be right after birth, or it could be decades later. Not only that, but exposure to different languages comes from so many different sources. In some cases, one parent speaks one language and the other parent speaks another language. Other times, both parents switch back and forth between languages. In still other cases, 
Both parents speak the same language in the home, but people outside the home speak a different language. And finally, multilinguals learn language from models who have a wide range of fluency. Some are fully fluent and some are far from fluent, and there's everything in between. Consider an example. I had a student who was born in L.A. to a father from France and a mother from Colombia. Growing up, both their parents were fluent in English, but not at a native level. At home, the family mostly spoke English, but the parents also spoke their native language to their daughter, but rarely to one another. And to complicate matters even further, almost every summer, the daughter would travel to France to be with her father's family, where she would speak exclusively in French. Compare this to my situation. When I was born in a small town far outside of Chicago, I came home to a family that spoke English all the time. And then I went to an all English speaking school and made friends who spoke to me only in English. Also, practically everything I heard on the radio and saw on the TV was in English. It probably wasn't until I took high school French that I heard more than a few minutes of something other than my native language. Now, times have changed and technology has made the world a more connected place. But still, I bet my situation is pretty familiar to many people who consider themselves monolingual. So this brings us to another myth. A bilingual brain is basically two monolingual brains rolled into one. Wrong. Although there are many similarities, Bilingual and monolingual brains are different in some important ways. Here's a big one. As you might expect from the diverse ways they learn language, multilingual neural mechanisms are much more complex and variable than monolingual ones. This variability is caused by a number of factors, like how many languages a person speaks, the similarity among those languages, whether they are learned at home or in the classroom, and the amount of use each one gets. These are all important factors, but the biggest may be age of acquisition. We've already talked about sensitive periods and language development, and you know that age of exposure strongly predicts phonetic ability in a language. But after infancy, the effects of age extend far beyond phonetics. For example, Alyssa Newport and colleagues have argued that many linguistic components are very fragile, and mastering them requires exposure to a language within the first 12 years of life. So in addition to accent, there are sensitive things like complex syntax and inflectional morphology, like markers for past tense and plurals. However, Newport observes that other linguistic aspects, like vocabulary, simple syntax, and basic pragmatics, these things are much more resilient and relatively easy to learn even late into adulthood. That said, there's still a lot of variability in what late learners can handle. Newport has some very nice data showing that age of exposure and competence in the fragile properties of language have a strong negative correlation over the first 12 years of life. But after puberty, the correlation goes to zero. A correlation of zero indicates that age no longer predicts variability in language competence, which means that variation after puberty is driven by individual differences, like genetic predisposition, educational opportunities, and life circumstances. So given these differences, what do the brains of these late and early learners look like? In 1997, Carl Kim, Joy Hirsch, and their team at the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York published a landmark study investigating how age of second language acquisition affects the language network in bilingual brains. The study used fMRI to compare differences in Broca's and Wernicke's areas of people who learned second languages as infants or as adults. Participants were put in a scanner and asked to internally generate silent sentences to activate neural networks of one language and then the other language. The main finding was that while Wernicke's area showed no differences across languages for both early and late learners, Broca's area did show a difference. For late learners, the two languages activated two separate subregions of Broca's area, but for early learners, both languages activated an overlapping area. This pattern in Broca's area makes sense given what we know about the dorsal stream of language processing. 
If you recall, this part of the language network is where phonological forms of words are activated and executed. Think back to Kuhl's theory of native language neural commitment. Because the brain commits to phonemes of a language, or languages, early in life, it can use prime real estate in Broca's area for the job. However, if a second language is learned after this neural commitment, it must rely on a different part of Broca's area that is not as optimally suited for phonological production. Actually, an analogy may be useful here. You know how a tennis racket has a sweet spot where hitting the ball has the most power and accuracy? If you think of the racket as Broca's area, that sweet spot is used for phonological forms of languages learned early in life. But if a second language is learned later in life, it must, it must use the area surrounding that sweet spot, and this lowers the power and accuracy. Sure, you can still hit the ball in both places, but the center is designed to strike it much better. Since Kim and Hirsch's landmark experiment, subsequent neuroimaging studies have mostly confirmed these differences using a variety of languages and ages. Not only that, but a recent meta-analysis shows that the later in life someone learns a second language, the more space is required in Broca's area. Why would that be? Let's try another analogy. This one's from the sociolinguist Rosina Lippi Green. Think about language, or languages, learned early in life as a new house. A house built on prime real estate using the best materials and constructed by expert architects and builders. Under these ideal conditions, it's possible to build a modest-sized house that can efficiently handle many languages. Now think of a language learned later in life as building an addition to this original house. Consider the sub 